And thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Justin Sleesman. I'm a perfusionist at Stanford Children's Hospital in Palo Alto, California. Relevant to this presentation, I serve as the AMSEC perfusion liaison to ELSO. And within ELSO, I represent perfusionists by sitting on their technology, conference planning, and steering committees. I am joined by two perfusionists uh, for this panel discussion on the COVID-19 Joint Perfusion Task Force. Luke Puis, joining us from Belgium, and Bill Riley out of Boston, Massachusetts. First off, on behalf of all the speakers for this presentation, I would like to say thank you to the Texas Heart Institute Conference Planning Committee for inviting us to present at your annual conference. Obviously, our profession is indebted to the foundational educational work that Terry Crane and all THI personnel who were or are involved in building, maintaining, and now growing the perfusion program at THI for the betterment of our profession. So we thank you. The group has no disclosures. Our focus for this presentation is to share the development and evolution of the COVID-19 task force. Then Luke will share some of the work he has done emerging CCPs and eCCPs in this process, followed by Bill highlighting institutional experience and lessons learned as the COVID-19 pandemic spread in the Northeast region of the United States. Lastly, we'll reserve 15 minutes at the end of our allotted time for a question and answer session. Okay, so who and what is the Joint Perfusion Task Force and how did it come to be or form? As COVID-19 pervaded our world and healthcare systems, I say with a heightened anxiety and concern peaking in mid-March, there was an increasing need to formalize a hub to help answer questions and lend support for perfusionists. Leadership from AMSEC, notably Jim Rager and Tammy Rosenthal, aligned with Bill Riley at the Academy, supported by Brad Kulot and Angarico at our Foundational American Board, who began the process of combining their knowledge, resources, and networks to construct and disseminate information using this platform. As word spread, we were astounded with a swift addition and participation from various organizations, societies, employers, and industry on a global scale. This slide shows this exceptional display of collaboration and all parties involved. The website URL, which you can see above, uh, 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 please take, take some time if you haven't visited it, um, if you're looking for any information on COVID-19, and also please contribute um, any information that you think pertinent for this task force. So we needed the website, which you saw, and had to decide on the main content, which you can see here. First, a discussion board was created to quickly share the early experiences and hardships for perfusionists clinically supporting patients with COVID-19. And I think this was the right thing to do just to get something up quickly where we could all share our experiences with you know, potentially just case reports to start on lessons learned, um, but just something quick that we could share on this task force website. Secondly, Braley Millen, Lection on health and wellness, providing links to resources for all of us who might be struggling with concerns and uncertainties with COVID-19 and mental health. We reached out to Elsa who quickly responded that all CCPs will be given a one year free individual mem membership, enabling access to their extensive ECLS COVID-19 resources, webinars and protocols, which are ongoing and present today. Next, Shelley Brown led the legislative and governmental resources section as questions emerged on licensure, employable state boundaries, staffing regulations and FDA leniency and products to help guide CCPs to better face this pandemic. Pertinent publications were posted, webinars were established, and perfusion industry partners continued to update on the supply distribution and projections, especially as we now head back to the operating room for elective cases. So as Zoom and social distancing became the norm, these webinars were a welcome tool of information sharing, and I think I'd say some FaceTime with colleagues. Uh, we started with centers that were first seeing these patients in the greater New York City area and Seattle, Washington. I think I, uh, like the majority of us out there, uh, personally and institutional, is that we were ready for a surge but had yet to see one COVID-19 patient in early April. Nick Mellis, who's the chief at Montefiore Medical Center in New York City, his presentation during the first webinar was eye-opening to me and I think others as well. You could feel his calm yet urgent tone over the webinar and how to prepare your staff for the stress that will come if faced with a surge of COVID-19 patients at your institution, specifically in the ICU setting. So we started with Nick, uh, Seattle, uh, University of Washington, Swedish Medical Center in Seattle as well. And our first three, which were you know, sequentially April 2nd, 9th, and 16th uh, weekly, were more case reports, institutional experience that we could share that knowledge. In the fourth, fifth, and sixth webinar, uh, I'd say there are more systematic approaches, and we reached out to kind of our colleagues across the pond with eCCPs and EuroELSO. So the fourth one was patient transport, EuroELSO data, kind of digging deeper into that, 
and also looking at some of the technology that might uh, help serve these patients, even if that was some of the older technology, such as Cytosorb, that was available but might have a place for COVID-19. Then we asked MDs to support us in our endeavors here for these webinars and had a lot of MDs talk for patient treatment and also going into reopening of ORs and CPP. Our last webinar, which was held on May 28th, uh, I think was a welcome addition from manufacturers and perfusion service organizations. Those organizations mostly being uh, specialty care and comprehensive care services, which provided us a, deep, a deeper di uh, dig or deeper look into uh, you know, where was the dip in uh, case volume and are we seeing it come back now and geographically where are these locations? And we, we absolutely support, uh, uh, we appreciate the support of the manufacturers and industry in highlighting that they are ready for, if there's a potential surge to meet that demand for ECLS equipment. So these numbers reflect the initial views from the two tools used to watch the webinars, Zoom and Perfusion.com's YouTube live stream channel. So we wanna thank Perfusion.com, Brian Lynch and his colleagues at Perfusion.com uh, for assisting in getting this information out and making this available on a webinar format. Uh, as you can see, like we said before, I think we met the demand initially in April with 785 initial views. Now these views are just who was there present for the first uh, offering and they are still available on the Joint Perfusion uh, website and Perfusion.com's YouTube live stream. So I suggest if you haven't viewed to go check them out if you're looking for information on COVID-19. But I think this reflects that we did meet that demand in the beginning. We hopefully answered some questions for our colleagues in the Perfusion community. And what's good to see also is that we still have a strong presence and strong viewership here with 327 for the last webinar. But I hope this reflects a trend back to the operating room and some normalcy uh, as we move forward. So in closing statement, what I find most valuable about this task force is that now the framework has been established. Whether we have a resurgence of COVID-19 later this year or we are faced with another global emergency down the road, this collaborative platform can serve as an educational hub and voice for our global perfusion community. And I regret not mentioning Kate Maud as Smith and Buckland, who is the absolute glue of this entire operation, holding us together on a weekly basis. With this, Sid, I'll now pass the presentation over to Luke Puiz. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for this very nice introduction. I will go briefly. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Texas Heart Institute to to uh, to uh, allow us to talk here as the as uh, members of the COVID nineteen task force, and uh, I will uh, briefly go on to to describe how uh, perfusion uh, organizations from Europe got involved in this uh, global joint perfusion task force. And here you can see an overview of uh, all the all the members of the of that task force, and um, there are three European uh, organizations, namely the European Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the Society of Cardiovascular Perfusion Scientists, that is the basically the UK. Um, uh, organization for perfusionists, and then the tiny perfusion letter, which is basically uh, myself. Uh, so I cannot speak for on behalf of the UK society, as I, I don't know who is represented uh, representing those and uh, how they got involved. But uh, the tiny perfusion letter got involved by someone saying that I should, be, someone saying to someone else that I should be on the perfusion task force. And then uh, through the tiny perfusion letter, I was I was uh, involved. Uh, there you go. And then I suggested also to have the European Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion uh, in the in the Joint Perfusion Task Force, so we could uh, exchange uh, information. Uh, I would just like to to remark that I regret that there are no uh, perfusion organizations from Asia or Africa uh, represented in in the task force and. Uh, we are busy with with talking to them uh, how we can how we can uh, ex include them for the future. So uh, the tiny perfusion letter is a weekly newsletter, uh, which gives you ten articles, uh, one or twice a week, once or twice a week uh, on scientific literature regarding perfusion. We did a few extra editions on on COVID related literature, and if you're interested, you can always uh, subscribe here. Um, and, and uh, th this tiny perfusion letter is also on the website of MSECT and on a few other websites. 
and this is how we we got involved into the into the COVID nineteen task force by providing literature. And then the European Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion is is a uh, is in fact the the over um, the 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 global uh, not not the global but the the association of all the perfusion side of most perfusion societies in Europe. Uh, they un they try to unite the European perfusionists uh, regarding uh, the standards in, in training and education and professional status of uh, perfusionists in Europe. There are about 29 countries uh, uh, united within the EBCP, as we call it. Uh, we have 20, 27 European countries and then there's Saudi Arabia and also South Africa who use our platform to... to uh, to use our standards for education and and, uh, and training. So you can find all their information on their website, ebcp.eu. And they are basically uh, represented by the Secretary General of uh, EBCP and the liaison between Euro ELSO and uh, the EBCP. Just like uh, Justin, there's a, there's a liaison between uh, the EBCP and the El Euro ELSO organization. And so then there's uh, a third representative uh, as a backup. And uh, we, the way we are uh, involved in the, in the joint perfusion task force is that we provide networking opportunities. We find speakers for webinars and we even uh, organized one, uh, the, the fifth one, I think it was. We exchange our experiences as we have a lot of ECMO experience, namely in, in uh, in uh, Italy and uh, France and Belgium, uh, of which I can speak of. Uh, we participated in the meetings and the webinars and, and we provided uh, uh, answers and questions to the discussion forum. Or when, in, for example, in the, in the, during the webinars, there were still questions after the webinar, we provided, uh, we tried to get answers by providing the questions on the different uh, discussion forums of the different organizations. Uh, and we also provided literature to answer questions on the forum. So as Justin said, uh, the future role of the Joint Perfusion Task Force uh, would be that we continue networking and uh, I've met a lot of people uh, by joining the task force. I've met a lot of people, learn a lot new things and we will continue the exchange of the experience and knowledge that we gained. And we are in this way ready, as Justin said, ready for new events uh, in case the, there's a second wave of uh, COVID or if there is another H1N1 uh, pandemic, we, we can now exchange way more rapidly uh, all our knowledge. This said, if we, if we can uh, go beyond COVID, then we could uh, try to get a global curriculum for perfusion education and training and try to set uh, a standard for certification, which would allow uh, easier exchange of certification jobs and recertification across the, across the globe. And we could also agree on, on more uniform research needs and methods and even um, Agree on, on a curriculum. So now I give. Thank you for your attention, and now I give the the, the podium to Bill Riley. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I want to thank the Texas Art Program Committee uh, for trusting us <laughs> with a live feed, and um, a heartfelt congratulations to all of the uh, Perfusion School graduates this spring. Uh, these times are crazy, and uh, you we uh, we get it. Um, we can't wait to um, see you guys in the workforce. All right. Sorry, folks. So I'm uh, joining you today, um, and I came to the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force as the current president of the American Academy of Cardiovascular Perfusion. Um, I'm also the director of perfusion services at Mass General Hospital in, in Boston. So here's uh, American Academy uh, was one of the um, original members of the uh, JPCTF, as we began to call it. And uh, we were very excited to be joined by other members from all over the world. It was a wonderful uh, collaboration to be part of. 
So what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about um, what it's like, uh, what it was like for us as a major metropolitan medical center in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, so far. Um, we became um, quite, a, quite a referral center for a lot of other hospitals, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And then at the end, we'll, we'll be able to answer your questions. So um, my first doses of COVID-19 reality actually started early in March. Uh, I looked back in my emails and saw that on March 3rd, I sent out some fairly um, uh, explicit emails to some representatives from industry asking about um, PMP oxygenators other than what we typically use. Um, and I think that was my first uh, hint that something might be uh, afoot. Um, after that, um, we moved along pretty quickly. We had our first MGH official COVID meeting with cardiac surgery folks March 12th. Um, but for me, it was uh, March 17th uh, of this year. Uh, we had an issue in one of our rooms with a breaker that kept tripping off and we called buildings and grounds and a, a guy showed up with a, a bunny suit on over his dark blue, you know, work uniform. And he had a tie on that had uh, beer signs and shamrocks all over it. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, that is the most unprofessional thing I've ever seen in my life. And then I remembered, wow, it's St. Patrick's Day. Uh, for a guy named Riley to forget St. Patrick's Day in Boston, uh, that means something's going on. So uh, that was the first like, wow, th these are strange times we're living in. Um, March 25th, I'm gonna step forward a little bit. Um, we went live with COVID passes here. Um, we have to go on our phone. There's an app um, every morning and attest to having no symptoms before we're let in the building um, as an employee here. And then with the COVID pass, you're let in the building, you get a squirt of hand sanitizer, a new mask, then you're free to go on your way. Uh, and um, again, a sign of the times, my jury duty for the state of Massachusetts wasn't just postponed, it was canceled. I mean, there are some silver linings uh, if you look hard enough, I think, in all of this. Um, so staffing in the face of our reduced caseload because of COVID was tricky. Um, we use Amion as our scheduling program here for monthly scheduling. And then I usually take that and I'll send out the schedule for the following day. Uh, MGH and Partners Healthcare, uh, actually now called Mass General Brigham Healthcare, um, was very generous in allowing folks to work from home whenever possible to keep everyone healthy. So uh, thanks to that, I was able to bring in about half staff for, for six weeks or so. And then I increased that with our ramp up days. So the, the weeks I'm showing here are Amion, the tall skinny one. Um, this is the, the week of May 11th to 15th. So we were pretty close to um, three quarter speed at this point. Um, but you'll see the tall skinny uh, photo there is Amion. That's what I, we usually use. And then um, every Wednesday night and Thursday morning, I'd work on an alternate schedule uh, to bring in as few people as possible, but still be able to cover our very varied and diverse caseload. Um, we kept the call folks as scheduled, um, and I tried not to assign anyone on my uh, new schedule that wasn't already assigned for the day in Amion. So I, I, there wasn't really much to do on your day off around here, but I tried to respect everyone's time off, and, and it worked out pretty okay. Um, I'll, I'll be working on a uh, clinical uh, practice guideline for how to do this at some point, so if anyone's interested, please reach out. Um, you know, one of the, one of the realities of this is I needed to have buffers for um, positive employees or, or people that just didn't feel well, even if it wasn't COVID. So um, this, this is a lot of responsibility and a lot of creativity went into this and an awful lot of support from my team. Everyone really stepped up um, every time they were asked to. And um, now we're pretty much at 75% capacity. Um, we actually have six cases uh, going on right now. Uh, that's why I'm in scrubs, not in my fancy dress shirt. Um, but um, you know, we're, we're, we're managing and we're just happy to be getting back into business. So we have, a, like I said, we're ramping up. Um, MGH proved to be a COVID hub for the region. We're, we're about a thousand bed hospital. At one point we had about 350 uh, COVID positive patients in house. Nothing like New York City. Um, and I'll, I'll echo uh, the sentiments about Nick Mellis's um, talk, the first uh, webinar we had. Uh, I think everyone was blown away um, and everyone was braced for that here, but luckily it didn't really happen that way for us. Um, we had, I think a total of 12 ICU floors. Um, I, I had a hard time actually confirming that, but um, right now we're in the phase of starting to get back to business. So ICUs for COVID are now being converted back. The nurses that were deployed there be going back to their original floors. 
uh, the ventilators from the OR and storage are being brought back to their original spots after a thorough cleaning from the biomed departments here. And, you know, I think everyone is going to walk away from this a little bit smarter and, um, you know, I'm not going to say better off, but um, I think we all learned a lot of lessons here uh, because I think, you know, just being responsible, um, it's very likely that something like this could come back to some extent in the fall. So um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conversations like that over the summer. Uh, and um, I'm, hopefully we're, we still have a forum to share whatever we're talking about when we, the dust settles. We have a little bit of time to um, to think about that. So, um, again, I want to um, thank you on behalf of the Joint Perfusion Task Force, um, Luke and Justin. Uh, we worked together on this and it was a, a pleasure working with you guys. Um, so uh, we have time, I think 10 to 15 minutes left, it looks like for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to relinquish my uh, control and uh, thanks very much. Clyde, um, what does work from home look like for a perfusionist? Since we're pretty much clinical people, what were your staff doing on their work from home? So we um, have a very busy service, but being Mass General, we're involved all over the hospital. So we're involved in research on many levels. We're involved in different protocols. So we use this opportunity to go through and buff up many of our dozens of protocols and clinical practice guidelines. We developed a few new protocols and clinical practice guidelines that we found we didn't have. And um, everyone was also on call technically. So um, there were a few times where we had to call people in. So it, it definitely wasn't, you know, doing a third time re-op every day, but we, we, we kept busy. For Luke and Justin, um, alternate working that your staff did, or did you ever feel that you were short staffed having to work with staffing in the crisis? I can take it on the, uh, you know, I work in a, a children's hospital. And so our biggest concern, you know, we're, we're neighbors with the adult uh, cardiac center at Stanford. And our biggest concern is that we're going to have overflow from the adult ICU into the pediatric ICU. So a lot of us, uh, the cases were on hold for a concern that we wouldn't have capacity uh, to uh, treat those patients or co potential COVID patients that would come in. Our staffing model, we didn't change because we didn't see a huge uh, fluctuation uh, of COVID-19 patients, luckily. Um, but we did talk about a process uh, to implement uh, potentially, you know, all of us would be on for two weeks or off two weeks. I think Cincinnati Children's adopted that philosophy. Um, so we did have, uh, let's say, protocols in place, but fortunately, uh, it did not affect our staffing model um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. And I can be very briefly, uh, I'm in between jobs. So during the first three months of the COVID-19 from March to end of May, I was in the United States, but I was not working. So I, it didn't affect me. <laughs> and we do have a question about uh, students uh, and uh, teaching these skills, um, obviously, we, we've not lived through a pandemic in our lifetimes, but what do you think are the takeaways that we need to maybe incorporate in perfusion education? I think for me, the take home message is that you need to you know, maintain your scientific knowledge about your equipment. I think a lot of us, not to say we're caught off guard, but the questions of how does COVID interact with a membrane of different styles of membranes? Are we properly exhausting our oxygenators? Are we wearing our, our certain PPE that would be relevant uh, for COVID-19? So I think the student in me, which is always there hopefully, is that you have to go back and read and make sure your knowledge base is, is adequate on the equipment that we use. I think, you know, as I sit in ELSO, I always uh, try to carve out a niche for us perfusionists is the fact that we are the experts in technology. And this is a great instance of where we should be the, in, the experts in technology knowing devices and knowing how COVID-19 could potentially interact with the equipment that we use. I'd like to speak to this, uh, Justin, if you're all set. Um, I'll speak to our perfusion students who, I think it was March 16th, I had to cut them loose. And uh, that, that stunk. We didn't like to do that at all. 
Um, I, I think I'll take a page from what we're learning with my two boys who are in middle school and high school. Um, I think perfusion schools need to be ready to do a little bit of distance learning uh, in the event that something like this happens again. I think we're all getting really good at Zoom, some better than others, apparently. Sorry, again. But, um, you know, I think uh, perfusion programs are going to have to build in some component of distance learning capability, even if they have it tucked in their back pocket, ready to go. Um, I don't know if simulation somehow can come into play, but um, I think this is a, again, a first time, a first off thing, but something we need to be prepared for again. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, this pandemic has taught me is that, um, that there are many things that we don't know and, and probably there's a, there's a lot of uh, room for a little bit of research there. Like Justin said, uh, those viruses, are they in the blood and do they come, do they go through the, the oxygenator? There was a recent publication about it, but they were not like, they were conclusive that you should uh, be, be, be aware of it, be careful, but without much evidence. So maybe there's a, there's a role for that. And, and also um, like we, we saw that people were, were creative in, in uh, creating solutions for uh, looking at their ECMO from a distance, uh, learning about uh, coagulation and, and how the virus affected the coagulation cascade. And it's, it's really an opportunity to learn here. So, and I think students, uh, I think most schools just suspended uh, education or try to find ways of distance learning and, and I think that will be will be more uh, um, uh, uh, we'll see more of that in the future the distant learning but of course perfusionists still need to be in the OR to learn mm -hmm. it's, it's a that's mm -hmm. a challenge for sure and we do have a question uh, from the chat Regarding COVID and use of ECMO at times for it, what has been the prognosis just in y'all's experience? How well Bill, is it going? How well do they do? Bill, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we at first had a triple of ECMO patients uh, about what we expected. And then we thought we plateaued. And, and fairly recently, we had a big spike um, to the point that we were kind of at emergency mode. Um, and a lot of these patients are presenting with long, like long-term uh, proposed ECMO runs. Um, with the perfusion team here is involved with ECMO, but we're not really the administrators from, uh, of that service. So I'm really not 100% confident to, to speak numbers, but um, we've put, I, I think over 20 COVID patients on now um, so far, but I just don't have the numbers to speak to how well they did. I know. There were a few high profile uh, weans off that, you know, were in the news and stuff like that, which is great. Um, but that's obviously just the tip of the iceberg. So. Mm -hmm. And is it predominantly VV? Yeah, we, we went with VV, Fem Fem VV, um, just because uh, at first it was to protect the folks up at the head. If we were going to be putting a dual lumen in, we didn't want people working so close to the, um, the, the nasal pharynx and stuff like that. So we did fem fem VV. I think we're still doing that for most, for, for almost all of our COVID patients. We did have a couple of VA COVIDs uh, with the acute myocarditis, uh, but that all needs to be worked out to figure out exactly what happened there. Yeah. If I I can I cannot speak from from a personal clinical experience, but there is a a survey of, uh, of uh, ECMO for COVID uh, going around in Europe. And I think they have now more than 1,200 uh, ECMO patients in that survey. And I think in the beginning, people were really like, taken, taken aback by the severity of some of these patients, of these uh, 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 patients with COVID. But I think now if I'm I'm not sure, but I think around 50 50 percent is the is the survival rate or the mortality rate. Like I think it's a 50 50. I don't know, Bill, if you can speak from that experience or. I, I mean, overall, it, not not uh, every center has has those figures. But, uh, I'm hearing yeah, that. I think if you combine and you look at the Euro also data and our also .org data um, across the board right now, discharge home is 54 percent. 
And at yeah. first, I think that, you know, we didn't know how to apply and they were triggering, figuring out how to apply ECMO and versus VA, VAV, VV, now obviously majority VV, of course. And so those numbers have improved as we've defined kind of, you know, who is the uh, ideal candidate or when to use ECLS support for these COVID-19 patients. But for in more information, uh, you know, reference the COVID uh, task force webpage, hit the link to ELSO or Euro ELSO, and there's great data and information on the entire volume of ECLS use globally. And Justin, you bring up a, a good topic. What is ELSO doing for the COVID ECMOs in terms of data capture and also, I, I saw that there was people could participate maybe without paying the usual ELSO um, participation fees. Can you tell us a little bit about how people could either use ELSO for, for data to look at or participate with their sure. uh, ECMO patients? Sure, and so uh, participation, it would be a little more challenging, but viewership is available with that uh, initial membership. It's under the, uh, if you are a center of ELSO, and you're included there, the data is includes those centers. So it's important to, to know that, yes, we're not gonna be able to capture all of the cases that are, are COVID-19, but it is a great database of over 500 centers that are submitting their information into this database to give us kind of information on is ECLS proper use and when is it proper use uh, for these patients. So the, you know, the, the membership to CCPs, which we're thankful, thanks also for doing that, uh, is waived. So you can go in there, look through the data, join the webinars, uh, 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 potentially contribute at some capacity um, for a year um, while this COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, continues. Thanks for sharing that. I don't think people realize that uh, they can participate with, without spending money or doing a membership or something like that in, for this time. We do have another question from the chat for all of you. For your patients, COVID positive needing surgery, are you changing your anticoagulation pro protocols? Doing anything different for the regular heart surgery patients that are COVID? We have not at MGH. I, I okay. think uh, it's very important to try and and not put people on, on bypass with COVID-19. Of course, there's always these urgencies, but I think you should, should have tried to avoid it at all costs. Um, and, and if you have to put them on bypass, I think you, you really have to be careful, but I have no, no, no knowledge of protocols of uh, putting more heparin in, or I, I cannot speak for that. And I think if we, and your your question is for ECMO, right? Not cardiopulmonary bypass. Would that be correct for ECMO? No, actually for cardiopulmonary bypass. Okay. Okay. So I think time will tell on that one as we get back to the operating room. Obviously, I think as we you know we learn more through ECLS as the front line of extracorporeal uh, circulation for these patients. Obviously, a lot of places that were maybe you know no anticoagulation for BV ECMO has switched because of this hypercoagulable state. So hopefully we'll learn that and translate that information to the operating room. But I think we're still a little too early to know because hopefully all these patients that are coming to the operating room are screened for COVID-19 and they're not going to elective heart surgery until, until negative yeah. antibodies. Yeah, I think also people who are really having a uh, hard time on, on with anticoagulation are the real uh, severe patients and hopefully they will not uh, need surgery at that point. So I think it's fair to say we haven't, you all haven't seen one. You haven't done a COVID patient on bypass so no. far. We, we've had patients that were COVID risk because they either came to us unable to be tested or with, you know, too acute to test. Uh, and I think now you need to have two negative tests 48 hours apart in order to be deemed negative. So we have a lot of COVID risk patients, but actually to my knowledge, I don't know that we've had a confirmed COVID patient on cardiopulmonary bypass. There, there are so some, some PUIs. Sorry. Uh, there are some case reports of p uh, people uh, getting put on bypass, which were unknown to be COVID-19. I think the mortality was really high uh, postoperatively because of the coagulation problems. 
Uh, there was a, a EBCP webinar uh, yesterday or two days ago where the Al Stammers gave a, a talk on that. And there, there are a few case reports uh, in the literature if you really need to need to know. And I, I can say uh, an un, we had one unknown. So it, it, it came positive two days later and it was a regular cab and obviously we didn't know, so we didn't do anything different, but just one uh -huh. experience. Yeah, as time goes on, it'll be interesting to see if the COVID positive but asymptomatic folks behaved differently on pump from the COVID positive and symptomatic, but it's, uh, that's, I think we're a ways away from having the numbers we'd need to determine that. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the theme. It's, we've all, as uh, Dr. Coulter Pol Pol pointed out, we've only been at this for 12 weeks or so in, in the United States, which is why I thought the international component of the task force was so helpful just to know what people ahead of us had experienced and done just to know. Uh, I think I agree the very first webinar um, was humbling out of New York just to know what they were experiencing, what was happening. And I think that's a lot of it. People just kind of fear the unknown and the sharing and just talking about it, I thought was helpful. And I'd ask all of you, what, what have been your takeaways from the task force and participating and um, what have you gotten out of it that you think you know people should know i think you know like i think all three speakers said is that we're set up for the future you know you know it's a lot of hard work in the beginning to organize personnel get the website going uh, to find content now that that's done i think i'm probably most proud about it is that you know this kind of transcends all organization societies for perfusions on a global level that we can go back and reference this and then build upon it as we face such things as COVID 19 or COVID-20, uh, who knows yet. But I think that's what I take from this is that, like Luke said, the networking, the ability to communicate, whether you're social distance at home or at the hospital, uh, I think is paramount to its, um, its application. Thanks. Yeah, nothing to, to add to that. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think we're at time. So for a live panel, I thought it went pretty good. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this and taking it on. Appreciate yeah, it. It's from overseas. Yeah. yeah. You You're welcome. Well. Thank you, TH, for having us. Yep. Yeah. Have Thank a wonderful you very conference. Much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.